What's going on guys? Welcome to another video on NJ Rides. Firstly, I hope you guys are all staying safe with everything going on with COVID-19 at the moment. Um, in New Zealand, we're in lockdown currently, so I can't really leave the house. Um, so yeah, just taking the time to do that video I promised you guys about um, what it takes to build a Subaru block up to 800 horsepower and some of the tips and tricks of learn. Yeah, so stay safe everyone. It's uh, crazy times at the moment, so hopefully things resolve themselves. All right, so getting into it, I'll start off by saying I'm not an expert. Um, this is my second time round building a high horsepower Subaru engine. Before I get into the actual motor build and what I'm doing on that front, I just wanted to share kind of three guiding principles that I've learned in building a car like this. So first thing is do your research. So I start off by saying I'm not an expert, but you can create really informed views based on doing your research. So um, phone up companies like Possum Bourne Motorsport, talk to Patrick. They are who I've chosen to do my build with and you know they're really helpful, great guys to work with and always willing to share information as well. So people like that are really helpful. Um, if you're in Auckland, give them a call. Uh, shops that have been there, done that, do this day in, day out. They are the ones that know um, everything and they're usually willing to share information as well. So um, reach out to them. Forums, uh, Club Sub, there's a number of other forums across uh, the interwebs as well. What you want to do is um, if you've got a theory or an idea, it's, it's probably already been done or looked at before, you want to verify that across multiple platforms. So uh, the internet is a great place to obviously find information. Uh, the key to knowing if it's going to work or not is find, finding examples where it has worked and people have verified that. So that's where the research comes into play. So second guiding principle is choose one shop to do your build. Um, so there's a big lesson learned for me on uh, the first time round. Um, what, what you want to do here is you want to choose a shop that will do your engine build, your fabrication work, buy your parts, install your parts and tune your engine. And the reason for that is if anything goes wrong during the process, they're seeing it through end to end and they'll make sure they do a great job end to end as well. As opposed to say if you get your engine built in one shop and the tune done somewhere else, um, you might end up in a situation where both companies blame each other for something done wrong. So, and usually the customer, yourself or myself, are left in the middle. So you don't want to be in that situation. Um, so again, I want to plug in Possum Bourne Motorsport here. Um, they do everything end to end and they do a bloody good job as well. So hit them up uh, and they can sort you out. Last thing is make a budget. So this is really important and it's linked to how much power you want to make as well. So if you, if you just want to make 250 kilowatts or what's that, about 300 HP, it's going to be very straightforward. You're not going to spend too much money. And um, compared to something like an 800 horsepower, 500 kilowatt build that I'm doing, um, things can snowball very quickly. So do your research, get some estimates from um, a shop like Boston Bourne. And once you've got a budget, you know what you're working with, how much or what bits you can maybe skimp on. Really, you can't skimp on anything when you're building something this big. Uh, but you know where you should be spending your money in. So um, yeah, that's those are, those are sort of the three main guiding principles if you want to do something this big. Yeah, so with that out of the way, um, we can get into sort of what I'm actually doing with my motor. I'll kind of just step through everything from the from the bottom up, bottom end. <laughs> I'll share some photos and things when I get to the video editing part. Um, but yeah, just want to say again, not an expert. This is just what I've learned, uh, what I've found through research and talking to people and things. So um, number one thing, power goal. So like I said, 800 horsepower, 500 kilowatts is the goal. The first thing you want to think about is the block. So. Obviously the Subaru um, EJ25 isn't the strongest block in terms of the block liner. So compared to the EJ20, um, the two liter JDM version, uh, the cylinder walls are actually uh, thinner. So they're bigger cylinders, which gives you the 2.5 liter capacity, uh, but the liner is actually a lot thinner. So you aren't getting as much rigidity and strength compared to a two liter block. Most common, um, the route for strengthening the block is you get a closed deck done. Um, so if you imagine, I'm going to try to illustrate this with my hands, but you've got the two block surfaces, you close deck the essentially the top of uh, the block halves. The most force is at the top of the stroke of the piston where the explosion happens. So that's the point where uh, the closed deck strengthening 
happens on your block so that's pretty good that's why i did it on my last build um and look it'll it'll see you right for most applications with what i've seen and heard we've i've seen a few scenarios where we're around 500 kilowatts a few people have cracked uh their blocks or, or cracked their cylinders um and again that's because the actual cylinder is quite thin um, and the closed deck gives you some rigid, rigidity, but uh, the overall cylinder is still thin. So um, the next step up is actually going sleeved. And if you think about the cylinder thickness compared to like a JDM 2 litre block, you've got a very thick cylinder and people actually push those JDM uh, 2 litre blocks quite far. I've, I've seen sort of 300 to 400 kilowatts just on that JDM block. So um, like I said, I've decided to go down the route of sleeves and I've chosen Darton sleeves as uh, the sleeves of choice. So with sleeves, it's really important that you pick a machine shop that's going to do a great job or the right job with putting them in. Um, sleeves can drop if they're not machined correctly and the main, the main thing with that is making sure the measurements and the machining is done exactly to suit. So. Um, like I've chosen or Possum Born works with uh, GER. They're probably some of the best machinists out there and really great guys to work with as well. Um, they are also supporting me on this build, which is awesome. So um, they're doing all the machining work for me. To get the strongest possible block, you can actually go an extra step once you've got sleeves like Dart in, in there and actually close deck that as well. And I'd say power wise, you're looking at in excess of about 1000 horsepower. That's probably a bit too overkill for me, and obviously with the closed deck, it means you've got this big decking plate across the deck surface, which also potentially limits coolant flow um, through the passages and things. It's not really a big deal, but I'd rather, one, stay a bit safer with having better coolant flow. And again, this is one of those contentious points where it could be or it couldn't be. But essentially for the power after 800 horsepower, uh, just going sleeves is completely fine. I don't need to close deck it as well. Um, these sleeves are big chunk of marker things, which I've shown you in a previous photo. So second thing to talk about is head studs. So many different opinions on head studs. This is one of the areas where I kind of struggle to get a straight answer from from everyone. And I think part of this is that um, most companies I've talked to have found a solution that works and have just stuck with that. So they don't really say this one's better or that one's better. Uh, but really your options are for this kind of power, uh, you go with the A ARP 625 plus aged 11 mil studs, half inch studs or 14 mil. So pros and cons, obviously if you go with the 11 mil uh, ARP 625 studs, you don't have to do any uh, drilling, tapping or any further machining. They go straight into the factory threads, which is great but you've got the smaller diameter, obviously a, a higher tensile strength on the actual rod, but because of the smaller diameter, you don't have as much clamping force, so you can't torque them up as much. So you might have heads slipping, not heads slipping, you might have the heads lifting when you run high boost and things. So as an example of research, uh, I've seen a few cases on the forums where people have had their heads lift sort of just above 400 kilowatts. So that wasn't really an option for me. And again, some of the conflicting things you might hear is it'll, it, it's all down to tuning, which it certainly is. But um, I think when you're building something like this, you don't want to be at all close to a failure point. So that was immediately out of the equation for me. So really I was down to pick, picking between 14 mil studs and half inch studs. Most shops use 14 mil from what I've, from what I've heard or what I've researched. With 14 mil studs, you've got to do more machine work, which is cost. Um, and there is potential where you're taking a lot more material out of the block and the heads itself. So you might be losing some rigidity there, but that's a point that I'm not too sure about again, because there isn't too much information out there. I chose to go with RCM 1412 super studs. So firstly, the material is actually really strong. I think it's aircraft grade. S99 steel. I need to check that, <laughs> but I'll put it in the um after I've actually edited it. So really good quality steel. Um, it's 14 mil in the block and 12 mil in the heads. So that means you can reuse the existing thread diameter. Um, or the, you you don't have to tap or drill the heads anymore or at all. Um, so you just that plug straight in and the 14 mil studs go straight into the block as well. 
Um, haven't really seen any scenarios where the half inch or 12-ish mil um, studs have failed. Um, and I've seen a number of examples of people pushing well over 500 kilowatts with these studs. So it's a great choice for me, meaning that's less cost in, in terms of drilling and tapping in the heads um, and ensures complete rigidity and, and clamping force when it comes time to put it all together and running some big boost. We talked about the um, we talked about the sleeves and the machine work briefly, but when you're putting in big head studs like this, you're actually putting uh, the block halves under a lot of torsion. Um, so with that and with a build like this, you want to make sure that the tunnel bore where your crankshaft goes through and your bearings sit and things um, are completely line honed because under torsion, you might be actually um, bending or putting out around some of those tunnels. Um, so uh, in terms of machine work, you want to get a line home done. There's quite a few theories around pinning the mains um, and going with ARP case bolts. Uh, again, mixed bag. Uh, what I've found here is a few people say it's a must do, and a few people say you shouldn't do it because you're making the block way too rigid. Uh, and when there is movement, it actually causes the aluminium to flex, which you don't want because that means it puts the block under stress and more prone to... Um, major failures so cracking which is what we don't want um, so I've gone down the route of just getting a line hone done not going with ARP case bolts and not pinning the mains because we do want we do want some flex in there yeah so the last thing you want is have um, the actual block flex through the aluminium and the block fail catastrophically so we don't want that we don't want money going down the drain so rods uh, this is Another interesting one, I think most people just stick with what they know works. For example, most people just stick with Manly. They've been around for a while and it works. It's a tried and true platform. Uh, I haven't fully decided on rods yet, but Possum Bourne sources in PPM rods. They're a company in Australia, um, who I believe makes some great stuff. And I think they've got a Brumby Subaru running about a thousand horsepower or around thereabouts on a, a H6 or a six cylinder. Uh, Subaru and it's running completely fine. Most likely going with those or boost line rods, which are a bit more expensive, but um, again, a more proven uh, solution from Wiseco. Yeah, so with rods, <clears throat> I'm not very much of an expert with them, but I will say you want to make a choice based on weight, strength, and where you want your power. So if you want a high revving, uh, if you want a high revving engine, you've got to choose rods and, and a crank specifically uh, that can rev high. Or if you want a really torquey engine, uh, again, that's a different set of rods potentially. Pistons. So I've chosen the JE piston range, the Ultra Series. Uh, so they're the top of the line JE pistons, and they've got like a, um, a coating on top. So with any engine, inefficiency is your enemy. So having a coated piston on the top means essentially that all the heat or the energy that that's produced in combustion can go into moving that piston up and down rather than the piston actually absorbing that heat which is inefficiency so the coating uh, effectively acts as a barrier um, to that heat there's also, also some mild um, protection in there in terms of de detonation uh, very mild barrier but um, good tuning uh, should be the main focus there uh, crank so um, the factory crank, uh, so the EJ25 night night rated, night rated, night rated, night rated. <laughs> um, so that crank is the go-to for most platforms. Um, I've seen IAG still use that as long as you crack test it and, and it's fine, uh, meets the hardness standard. Uh, you can use that and they rev it up to almost 8,000 um, RPM or well, they recommend you rev it up to 8,000 RPM. So that's a stock uh, 2.5 litre crank. You can, if you're balling, uh, I'm, on a, I'm balling on a budget, so um, I've gone with the factory crank, but you can get, there's, there's a few options out there. So I think Manly, Manly do one, um, K1 Technologies do one as well, but you're looking at two, two and a half grand just for the crank on its own. So um, yeah, I'm choosing not to spend my money on the crank. So we, I talked about my budget, right? So this is one of those contentious points where you go, um, is it really going to give me that much benefit? Um, and for me, the answer is no. I think as long as my 
factory crank is uh, within the spec, so it meets the hardness test and is safe enough and not gonna fail on me, I'm good and I'd rather spend that money elsewhere. So I've made that, that trade-off call. Quick note on, on oil galleries. So um, most shops will go through all the oil galleries in the block and make sure they're uniform, uh, make sure they can flow enough oil and things. This is another gray area where people won't share um, their insights or secrets with you. So I don't have too much to share there, except for um, there's some work that, have, that has to be done there to make sure that you get good, consistent oil flow uh, to your bearings and things. Right, onto heads. Um, so on my previous build, I got uh, just a hand poured and polished done. Uh, again, if you're seeking, I don't know, say 500 horsepower or I was about 350 kilowatts, um, it's probably okay for those sort of power levels. But uh, when you go for big power, again, you want to have the very efficient engine. And the best way to get efficiency is um, to have flow through your engine. Um, so your engine's basically um, a big pump, right? You pump air in, um, and as long as you've got this, the right flow, they can match your turbo. So I've got a, a big sucker planned, <laughs> uh, the EFR 8474, and I believe it can flow something like 89 to 100 pounds of air a minute. Um, so flow through the heads is really key. And the big part of doing that correctly is um, getting CNC porting done. This might be one of those areas where people might used to go, um, people might want to get a hand port done because it's cheaper. But I think with the help of Kevin at Horsepower Heads, who's done all my head work, um, you can get it done at a reasonable price. Kevin at HP Heads has done a number of these for multiple 500 kilowatt STIs or Subaru's down in Christchurch. With that, he's got a program that works for a full CNC port of your um, inlet and exit ports. So it'll do a multi-angle valve job as well, cut the valve seats and all of that, um, all done on the CNC. So um, that's basically what I chose for this build. I've gone with Ferrer, if I pronounce that correctly, Ferrer, Ferrer valves. Um, they're... Econo. <laughs> so for valves, I've gone with Econo valves. Um, so they are rated for um, high temperature without failure um, and plus one mil in size compared to stock on both the intake and exhaust valves. Cams have gone roughly middle of the road. Um, they'd probably be rated a seven out of 10, I'd say, in terms of how aggressive the cam is. So a bit more than middle of the road. I've gone with uh, 272 Calford cams. You wanna be careful with the cams you, you select because you can really push your power band all the way to the right or the middle or further down as in quick spool. If you choose a too small of a cam or too big of a cam and you're pushing the power band all the way uh, down the end. So um, when you're choosing cams, you want to think about your turbo, think about when you're going to hit peak boost and for how long you're going to have that meet in the power curve and then choose your cams accordingly. Uh, 272s are great because I think you get a pretty reasonable meaty power band throughout. I want to try to get the best out of spool and top end power. So uh, these are probably the best cams for my application. And power-wise, they sit right in the right range for around 500 kilowatts. So yeah, 272 cams uh, with my engine. It's dual AVCS as well. So these cams from Calford uh, will do a fantastic job. Valve springs and retainers. I've gone with the titanium uh, Beehive uh, valve springs and retainers. Uh, so that should be great for one launch control and putting a ton of boost through this engine when it's done. So cool. So last thing to cover off is head gaskets. I haven't fully decided on which head gaskets I'm going to be getting uh, for the build, but most likely uh, I'll be going with the RCM multi-layer gaskets. Again, with this multiple options, um, if you've got a JDM two liter block, you can typically go with the O-ring solution, which is pretty good. But I think with this, I'd stick with the tried and true, so either IAG, um, JE, or RCM. Um, and again, I haven't done too much research on this yet, so I um, can't comment too much. But yeah, RCM is probably the right thing to go for. Yeah, look, so thank you for watching. Uh, it's been a bit of an ad hoc video, but uh, I thought I'd just go through it with you. Look, if you've got any ideas, suggestions, comments, put it in the comments below. Um, any questions, I'm happy to answer them to the best of my knowledge. The next video, I'll probably talk about the parts um, that, that I'm going to bolt onto this block and how we're going to get to that magic number of 500 kilowatts. So, 
yeah thanks for watching guys Ooh.